Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, this is Between Us, part of the Six Feet Photography Project. I'm your host, Mike Bellamy. Um, I particularly want to thank my guests for the evening, Stacey Kranitz and Andrew Milan Millward. Did I say your name right? I meant to ask you that beforehand. Um, it's actually Malin, but Malin. It, okay. you're saying as it should be pronounced. I just, it got like <laughs> Latin by Kansas, the A, the Malin, okay, got it. Um, so Stacy deserves a huge congratulations right now because she is a current Guggenheim Fellow. Anyone who's in the photography community knows that that is about as big of a acknowledgement um, of someone's work that you can get. And, uh, and some of the, the project, the, the scale of projects that we'll be talking about later uh, tonight in the discussion are the kind of things that come out of Guggenheim fellowships. I mean, just uh, no pressure, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's uh, really amazing to, to see you recognized in that way. Um, also, her first monograph is uh, set to be published by Twin Palms, as it was given to me. Um, she is represented locally here, uh, well, locally for us who are here in Asheville, by Tracy Morgan Gallery, where she uh, recently had a solo exhibition. Uh, she also does editorial work for such publications as Washington Post, Mother Jones, Vice, Fader, Bloomberg, Business Week, and many others. Uh, and our other guest, who's Stacy's not only uh, partner in collaboration, but life partner as well, Andrew Mallon Millward. Uh, he is the author of Agriculture Hall of Fame, the Agriculture Hall of Fame, which was awarded the Juniper Prize for Fiction by the University of Massachusetts. And I Was a Revolutionary, published by Harper Collins in 2015 which was awarded the Friends of American Writers Literature Award. And uh, I've been catching up on reading some of his stuff this week and really loving it. So uh, tonight we are talking about one of the most common collaborations that we as photographers take part in, which is the collaboration between photographers and writers. Uh, Stacy and I, and probably many of you on this call uh, who, who do work as editorial photographers, um, this is a common way of working for us, but uh, there's a lot of different ways this collaboration can take shape. Uh, we, we tend to, in the editorial world, kind of follow the lead of the writer, and um, our job is kind of to illustrate the, the subjects that they cover and the, the scenes that they describe, although uh, that's the most common way this collaboration can work. There's a lot of other ways that can happen, and, I think often there, there can be more successful and interesting ways that this collaboration can unfold. Um, after looking at a little bit of work from, uh, from Stacy and hearing some from Andrew, we're, we're going to get into some history and look at some particularly noteworthy collaborations. Uh, this, this particular history of collaborations between writers and photographers is not something I'm super well versed in myself, so I'm going to kind of at that point, take a bit of a step back and hand it off to them to, to kind of talk about it. And I'll just, maybe if I have any questions, I'll jump in. And if any of you have any questions, as Susan just said, you can type them into the chat and we'll get to those um, either at the end or if they're really relevant to what they're talking about in the moment, I may interject with uh, something from the chat. Um, but first, I, I kind of like, Stacey and I were talking in the beginning, I, I hate to just kind of like, rushedly go through uh, some of these bodies of work that really deserve um, our entire hour of our attention, but I really wanted to just kind of get a, a, a quick sense for uh, some of the work that these guys have done in the past, um, particularly Stacy's uh, project that's the, the book project that's uh, coming out. Um, so Stacy, hello and welcome, and Andrew. Um, and like I said, let's just go ahead and jump in real quick with, with some of this as it was given to me work. And um, if you don't mind sort of talking us through it a little bit, uh, it's, I know it spans a, a pretty long period of time, so you can kind of get us up to speed a little bit on, on your work and um, what all has gone into this project. 
Um, share. share. Okay. Um, thanks so much for uh, having us, Mike, and thanks yeah, everyone course. for uh, making time to to join us to talk about um, writing and photography. Uh, so we're going to look at, I'm not super familiar with this preview program on my Andrew's <laughs> computer, so I'm just going to do my best. Um, see, see. Okay. So are we, is Mike, is everyone seeing that? Yeah, we're looking good. Great. Okay. So obviously I started the slideshow in the middle like a pro. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to go backwards. Uh, so this uh, project uh, is, um, I'm in the 10th, maybe 11th year. It's kind of, um, I've had to stop counting. Um, and the Guggenheim is actually a new chapter, an extension of this project, which um, is at this point a life, a life work. Um, so when I started it, gosh, I was in grad school. I was at um, uh, UC Irvine. I was driving out every summer for four months, living out of my car. And I was developing this relationship uh, with the region that both Mike and I live in, um, Appalachia, which is a massive chunk of the United States. Uh, and I was looking at um, sort of different um, extractive um, industries, including coal mining and photography um, and the ways that these two things have sort of done harm to the region. Um, and so that's really what this project is about. Um, it's about, uh, it, I'm sort of looking at um, the region in a really self-reflective way, looking at my relationship as a photographer to how I portray the region as much as I'm just straightforwardly portraying um, the place. Uh, I work kind of in a like immersive uh, way where I just um, wander about and dig into the people's lives that I meet. Um, and then there's also a large part of the project that involves a pretty rigorous amount of research. Um, I, there's four to six archives that I sort of spend a lot of time in in the region. So I've um, developed a lot of work out of those archives as well. Um, so it's kind of a merging of all of these things. Um, it's certainly one of those projects that tries to do maybe way too much. <laughs> and that's why it's a life's work. Um, that's the best so kind of project. Uh, as Mike said, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The best kind. Okay. Good. <laughs> uh, or the only kind I know how to make. Um, so yeah. Uh, and uh, and so it's true. There is. Um, I have a book coming out one day. We are literally in the slowest. We're like the slowest track to ever make a book. But um, speaking of photography and text. Oh wait. I'm just screen sharing. I'm going to show you the book after we're done. Okay. Um, so this is just a kind of random selection of images. Hopefully some of you who are more regional got a chance to see the, um, the exhibition that I did have at um, Tracy's Gallery in Asheville. And actually, I, I believe we're, I'm going to be showing it, uh, well, everything's been pushed back so much, but it, it'll be in uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, for those of you okay. there in uh, August 2021. <laughs> and Stacy, can you tell me the role of this character that we just saw that was you? Um, can you kind of talk oh, about Christy? that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Christy is actually, um, it, so yes, yeah, so before I met Andrew, I had a real relationship with Jen. I think that um, all of my projects have some correlation with a novel, potentially several novels. Like most photographers, I end up with stacks of books that um, are like incredibly connected to the work that I'm making. And one of those mm -hmm. books is um, a Christian romance novel from the <laughs> 1960s uh, mm -hmm. called Christy. And the reason why I became interested, so it's a, um, so I, I didn't, I wasn't as familiar with the novel till later. I actually grew up on the mini series on CBS. Um, home to a lot of Christian television shows, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, just happens to be. Uh, and so I, uh, I think what really interested me about 
Christy, was that the missionary and the photojournalist, there's like a direct corollary between the two. They're both asserting a right and a wrong onto a group of people. Um, mm -hmm. And I became really interested in how potentially this documentary photography or the photographer was directly related to colonialism and this long legacy. So the missionary is in that. There's the um, explorer, the, the Daniel Boone type character, um, which also plays a role in the work. And then there is um, the missionaries. And then much later, we have the, the photographer journalist coming in the local mm -hmm. color writers. And I just became really interested in this long history of how we represent place. Mm -hmm. Certainly a place that we build a, a, a huge mythology around, like Appalachia. Oh yeah, there, yeah. that's me as Christy too. That, that's like the dark Gothic Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Christy morphs, she morphs into all kinds of strange, crazy things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, this is the project. I'm sorry, I didn't have much of a formal introduction to it. Um, but That's, feel free at the yeah. end to ask me questions about it. Yeah, well, now look, Andrew. I have a lot of questions. That's me. <laughs> 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 That's Andrew. That's me. So this is actually um, I got. I was so fortunate uh, last summer to uh, have an artist in residence at the Great uh, uh, Smoky Mountain National Park. And uh, mm. that's actually where Christy lived, kind of on the edge of the park um, where she was a missionary. And so I actually got, Andrew baptized me in the, uh, in the river, right in this town that she was uh, in. French Broad, cool. On the French Broad, yeah. <laughs> and this is also uh, right in North Carolina, at Hot Springs, North Carolina. Oh, nice. Okay, so that's it, so that's that. Um, okay. I'm going to stop the share. Okay. Um, so one thing I want to ask specifically about that body of work is, uh, in this case, this is a body of work that's existing on its own without, at this point, without, you know, a collaboration with the writer or anything like that. But you are incorporating text. And you spoke a little bit about that. But could you uh, walk me through a little bit of where some of that text is coming from and what role you feel like it plays in that project? Yeah, this was a really small project that came out um, in 2017. Um, and it actually was like a really exciting thing to me because it has very few images. It actually, it's, um, it's uh, available through Here Press. I don't know if there's any copies left, mm -hmm. but you can kind of see it was such a bold thing for me. So there are photographs in it um, from the work, uh, mm -hmm. but this text, um, was one of, I consider it being from one of the archives um, that I utilized, but in, the ca in this case, the archive is actually a newspaper. It's mm -hmm. a family-run newspaper, one of the longest-running family-run newspapers um, in Appalachia. It's a, it, it's a really, yeah, yeah, in uh, Letcher County. Letcher. Yeah, and um, it's called the Mountain Eagle. And in the Mountain Eagle, they actually had appropriate this column which is called speak your piece and they appropriated it from um, a newspaper in the midwest so they didn't originate the idea but essentially to this day since maybe i think it was the 90s they started it i have the exact date somewhere um mm -hmm. you can call write or now email in whatever you, you wanted to talk about um mm -hmm. and they would publish they publish everything and i feel like I know this because I often wrote in to speak your piece um, and share <laughs> nice. a lot of thoughts and feelings um, awesome. <laughs> anonymously. Well, everything's anonymous, which is really nice. Although some people provide yeah. a lot of details and it's pretty clear. Who <laughs> some people want to be found out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's really a, it's such a, a really fascinating really thing to have access to. And so you were able to read some of this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. And it'll actually play a pretty prominent role in the Twin Palms book that's coming out as well. Cool. Um, I think that there's a really, uh, there's a lot of power. So, you know, I'm obviously offering my perspective through my photography, and then there's some historical context through the archival material. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the um, I consider myself an editor of this of this text, um, and that's how I'm I'm accessing it. And I think what really it it allows people to speak on their own terms, 
in a way that is, um, I think what I see, and I kind of write about this at the end of this book, is that um, it challenges me to make my photographs deeper because the, because you can really, there's an intimacy in the text, um, the anonymous yeah. text that people are presenting about their circumstances, about their life, about their beliefs. Um, and so once I tapped into this archive, I, um, I don't know, I think it, it, it challenged me to make photographs that met that uh, intimacy. So one thing I want to touch on with both of you guys to hear your perspectives on, and this is something that like, I seriously, we could spend an entire hour on this one topic, and it's one of my favorite things to talk about, uh, is basically truth and uh, fiction versus nonfiction in our role as the photographers or writers in, in representing uh, the world as we see it, and what, what do we call it? Do we, we, do we call it truth, what we're seeing, or uh, in, in some cases, um, it, it may be the case that through fiction, we can kind of tell our truth in a more deep way than, than we may find through uh, journalism or tr aiming toward ob objectivity. And, you know, there's this kind of, I, there's this whole mindset with, through photojournalism, which is just kind of like using certain uh, structure and tools to try to keep our own subjectivity at bay and to try to represent the world in the most objective way possible. And your work, Stacy, kind of like reacts against that. Um, you call your work nonfiction, and and to my understanding, that's that's kind of just a a acknowledgement of the inherent, um, you know, the the you that's in it, and uh, the the fact that you're you're kind of telling your truth rather than any kind of objective truth. Uh, I'd love to hear you both kind of talk about this line between fiction and nonfiction and and what you think your uh, responsibility to the truth or what the truth even means to you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's tricky. And I think like in, in kind of the literary world right now, you know, one of the most kind of like thriving genres uh, you know, is what's called autofiction and um, a highly subjective kind of form of, of fiction in which the writer is often the protagonist writing about their, his or her, their life um, uh, in, in pretty naked ways. Um, and, you know, for me, I mean, you mentioned I was a revolutionary, um, which, you know, was my last work of fiction, uh, and that was a book that, you know, it, it moves through 150 years of kind of radical history in, in the state where I grew up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I knew, you know, I, I wanted to be able to engage, you know, factual history with my fiction to, uh, you know, uh, E.L. Doctor, one of the kind of models for me of how to engage history and politics and fiction, you know, once said that, you know, the, the fiction writer hopes to lie him or herself to a truth, you know, then it, that is greater than factual reportage. Um, and so I think being able to take the license to inhibit the consciousness of certain characters, um, oftentimes having, you know, engaging real historical people or events um, and having my fictional stuff kind of bump up against things um, was, was, very exciting to me and, and interesting. And yet the book that I, my most recent book is a work of straight nonfiction. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this book called Jayhawker on history, home and basketball. Um, it's all about my obsession with basketball. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and that was one, you know, where I was, I, you know, that line for me, I think was, was pretty firm. There is a, a kind of radical strand of, of creative nonfiction, mm -hmm. you know, that amplified by a writer named John Degada, who just say that like, don't really matter. Like, I'm gonna call this as nonfiction, but he's open about like how he changes, yeah. you know, moves things around because what matters is the art. You know, it's mostly what we think of as nonfiction, but he 
for the for the sake of art he moves things around but he's open about it yeah uh, for me i i tried to you know with the understanding that even trying to stick to the so-called facts is always like an inherently flawed thing and and highly subjective i did i think with jayhawker try to stick to a a more of a line of like do i th do i remember this actually happening you know and mm -hmm. um and it was a very different writing experience for me than writing fiction. It was much more um, anxiety producing for one. I, I mean, I was just yeah. more vulnerable. I was more on the page. Like, you know, I don't come off as in the back light at certain points. And, uh, yeah. and, and I know that, you know, I know it was a different writing experience for me, but I know it also makes for a different reading experience, both for people who don't know me, but especially for people who do know me, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it was kind of, I didn't think about that necessarily. I, I was thinking kind of solipsistically about what a different experience it was for me. And I didn't think about like, what it's like for a family member to, to, to read me sure. writing. It's probably best not to think about that when you're writing <laughs> yeah. it, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> I forget who it said, you know, but write like your family's dead, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of some of my thoughts on that issue. Uh, how, how about you, Stacey? Um, I feel like I have a really specific belief around the this sort of question. There's, a, I feel like the dichotomy, like of truth fiction, isn't is is like wrong because I believe that truth is the fan is a fantasy like the idea of truth is a fantasy it's it right. doesn't it doesn't add up yeah. and that's the departure point for me and i see that not as bad or scary or uh problematic i see it as like exciting and like a foundation yeah, yeah for like a whole new a, not a new way that would be incredibly uh untrue uh, a, a a much more honest way of making yeah. work and so that's mm -hmm. how I develop all of my work, which is that this 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 idea of the truth is the fantasy, and therefore the merging of fiction and truth is the most honest way to tell the most truthful way, actually, to tell the story. And um, I believe that if you're, and this is this is where I get a little um, maybe. I would love to hear someone argue against this. Um, but for me, in this contemporary kind of documentary tradition, this tradition that I'm very much happy and um, and I, we're gonna share a lot of work from this tradition that I love being a part of, I don't believe as contemporary photographers we can make work uh, that on a gravitate towards or engage with unless we're honest about that, unless we're honest about the failure yeah. of the documentary mm -hmm. tradition to tell the truth. Um, because okay. otherwise, I think that we're participating in the colonial project. Mm -hmm. But feel free to argue against that if you would like to, because I would be interested in that. All right. Well, if anyone disagrees with Stacy, you can say so in the chat. But <laughs> I think, no, I, I, I'm on board with that for sure. Uh, so, like I said, time is just getting away from us, but already we're gonna, we're gonna, let's go ahead and uh, talk about a collaborative project. Well, it's not a collabor collaboration in the sense that you work together on it, but it's two standalone projects that are kind of in conversation with each other in an interesting way. Um, and it's about uh, cockfighting in Louisiana. Um, so Stacey made a, a kind of a, well, she'll talk about it, but a, a, a photo essay about that and uh, in, in the last years of it being legal in Louisiana. And um, Andrew, tell us how that prompted you to do what you did and, and uh, you can maybe read for us a little excerpt from that. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, we can talk about this, um, Maybe when we get to talking about kind of the his, the history of some of these books that we're gonna we're gonna talk about, but you know, on kind of a one of our early dates, uh, Stacy had suggested that we exchange work, you know, books, and so I brought a couple. You know, I brought Agriculture Hall of Fame, and that was a revolutionary, and and one of the books she brought to exchange with me was not only the Speak Your Piece earlier, but her um, 
Louisiana Cockfighters Manual, um, which she'll probably show you here a little bit more. Um, and, you know, there was one image in particular for me that, um, that really resonated. I think after I was a revolutionary, I had about, that came out in 2015, and I had five years where I was working on the basketball book and I was working on a novel that in failing and just staying in the drawer, longer things. I wasn't writing stories anymore. And it was really this image that, that Stacy had taken um, of a cockfighter that I kept coming back to and which led me to kind of write, to want to write short fiction for the first time in, in mm. five years. And so, um, so yeah, and you know, this is actually growing into, it started off as just this one story, me writing reaction in, in reaction to an existing photograph. Um, but we've actually talked about now doing a potential larger project that sort of focuses on sporting life in the South and, um, kind of strange aspects of it, gray area aspects of it. I was drawn to the aspect of blood sport and um you know how of course how controversial it is on one hand it, it seems you know um to to a lot of people incredibly unnecessarily violent and yet to to some people who grew up in that culture it's it's a vibrant part of that culture and i think that's really interesting yeah. that's where you get to like the stuff that feels really hot and interesting and so yeah. anyway i'll uh Maybe if, if you guys will bear with me, I'll read just a, a little excerpt, a very brief excerpt, just about five and a half minutes of, um, you know, this is the first few pages of, you know, a much longer story. But um, this is the story I'm talking about when, uh, when I was inspired by, by Stacy's photograph, photographs. All right, it's called Chicken Man. Vic Rabelais was making the evening rounds at his game farm when the wheel, ch wheel of his chair caught on a rock. It was so small he could barely see it, but nonetheless it hung him up and he had to use all the strength in his arms to propel his wheelchair over the obstacle before he can continued down the dirt path to the fly pen. His niece Luce was inside, pacing on the oyster shells and rice straw that covered the floor pen watching as the birds went about their flying exercises. They were conditioning 30 birds with the hopes that a handful would be ready to battle that weekend in Dusan. The rest Vic sold to cockers as far, far away as Thailand and the Philippines. Luce held one of them in her hands, Jewel, his ace cock. How's he doing, Vic called out. He'd fly all day if we let him. We can't have him exhaust himself before the derby, said Vic. Bring him here. Luce did so, and Vic took Jewel into his arms, resting him on his lap. He held him on one hand, he held one hand underneath Jewel and used the other to stroke his feathers softly, always in the same direction. His best bird liked to be held, and Vic could feel Jewel's pattering heartbeat slow for the littlest bit. He was a beautiful rooster with a bright sun orange hackle that gave way to speckled saddle flutter feathers of brown, white, and red, and finally, a regal Prussian blue sickle. He wasn't just pretty either. In a sport that could end in a matter of seconds, plenty of birds didn't survive a single fight, and most more than a few, but Jewel had already won nine. What you say, Uncle, said Luce. Let's let these boys fly a little longer, and after dinner, we'll have them walk the stream. They made their way back to the house where Vic's mother was in the kitchen, stirring something in the Dutch oven. Everyone called her Teensy because she was so small, even though she was tougher than most anybody. The three of them sat at the table and ate sausage and rice from bowls, speaking now and again, but mostly just savoring the warm food and the sounds of the roosters in the yard. They crowed from first light to last, a cacophony of screech and cluck, unsettling to most, but reassuring to a chicken man like Vic. Luce was his brother's daughter, but Doug worked out on the rigs in Eastern Texas and could only get home to Erath for a visit when he could every couple months or so. Luce was 17, but already one hell of a cocker. Even on school days, she helped him before she left and after she returned. Vic had taught her how to train and condition birds, raising them up from shell to pit, 
and at the fights she was his legs, pitting and handling the birds as Vic looked on from his chair, taking notes on each fight in his notebook. Soon, however, it would all be over. It was the last year of legal cockfighting in the country, and Louisiana was the final state to enact the ban. Over the last decade, as other states shut down the sport, Outsiders had flooded into the area to fight at St. Dusan, Karen Crow, Opelousas, Rain, Dulac, St. Martinsville, Venice, and of course, the biggest and best pit of all, Sunset. Come August 2008, however, they would all have to give it up or go underground. It was already April, and Vic wasn't sure what he'd do. Um, I'll stop there for now. All right, <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> that was great. I I really love, uh, as the story goes on, the development of between the, the characters of Vic and Luce and the, you know, the, the kind of sense of protectiveness that Vic has, but also um, it's kind of just a caring relationship, especially as she starts to get into the, the relationship with the, the other, the cockfighter, other cockfighter guy. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Um, did you do any uh, other research for that aside from? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we both love uh, some research. Andrew <laughs> watched, I didn't even do this. Andrew watched eight hours of interviews with cockfighters. Wow. Incredible. Is it, was it a DVD? Yeah. Uh, that he got from Interlone. Um, and, uh, and I was impressed that you got through all eight hours. <laughs> yeah. I, I spent a lot of, or a fair amount, because uh, we both are are, are pretty research uh, intensive in our in our art, and um, mm -hmm. and so I think when when cockfighting cockfighting became illegal, a lot of things around it obviously became hard to get, or or there's a gray area there about what can be sold and what not. You know, and um, so I, I was going down weird eBay rabbit holes trying to track down these old like cockfighting magazines and and uh, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was it was really interesting and fun. You know, like I, I uh, you know, it, it was fascinating and, and yeah, it all grew out of kind of seeing Stacy's pictures from that time period. You know, she was there that last year before um, it was it was legally outlawed and um and, the trip we went on. and then we 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 together we went on a trip together just uh last year a year before last and uh mm -hmm. i got to see a lot of these towns you know obviously the cockfighting isn't happening above ground right now but um but to visit a lot of these places like erath where this you know the town where this takes takes place tucson all, all these you know um yeah. got a, got a sense of the place and and could kind of visualize what I was writing about in a way that is a little bit harder you know when you're just sort of looking at google image or or reading books <laughs> yeah yeah well how about we take a look at uh some of Stacy's work on the subject yeah so I will say that it actually is a manual um <clears throat> that I constructed based on uh historic research and it it is uh if you did read it, I can't sell it because it, I, anymore because it's such an it's so embarrassing the way I designed <laughs> it. It's just so poorly done. <laughs> so I, it's not available right now. Uh, but it does actually teach you how to condition and fight your bird. That was part of the project, um, and then it's also a celebration of the last days of the sport and. Um, it's part of a series of projects I was doing around violence as catharsis. And so I was very interested in the relationship between man and bird, the tenderness of that relationship, which I think Andrew's piece really gets at. Um, and so I'll just screen share here, because I'm an expert now. <laughs> share, or am I? I spoke too soon. Uh, oh my gosh, where is it, Andrew? Wait, I lost it. <laughs> okay. Guys, bear with me here. I'm learning. Right. Okay, look at this. Oh man, I am not a pro. This uh, is what you're good. Don't no worry. This is this is a casual situation. You're good. <laughs> exactly. it's, look at this. It just shows up. I don't even know how I got it. And again, Boom. 
we're in the um, slideshow, but we're like in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is um, some of the um, images that I appropriated from different um, historical texts mixed with some of my work. And again, I was, um, I photographed all of this when uh, cockfighting was still legal in Louisiana. Um, it had been outlawed in every other state. Uh, and so it was, um, it was my first um, kind of immersive project. And um, I learned a lot about how to make the kind of work that I make now, but it is very, very rudimentary in terms of my skill level <laughs> and uh, what I understood about how I wanted to tell stories. So, so yeah. Well, I brought this up with Matt Eich a couple of weeks ago too. I'm just impressed with you guys that like you have work from mid 2000s that long ago that still does hold up pretty well. Like <laughs> compared to myself, like you will not be seeing any pictures I took from that time period ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only bring out very few. It is uh, definitely uh, hit and miss there in that yeah. period. Uh, no, I'm impressed. So. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going through this quickly, but um, actually, a lot of this is available on my website. So if you did want to kind of engage with it a little bit more slowly, you are more than welcome to. And I, I uh, spent a lot of time watching. So you couldn't actually photograph in um, the uh, pits, um, but eventually I did get access, uh, but it was only at the very, very end. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, that's why a lot of this work is kind of around that, which I, I think actually works out kind of nicely. But yeah. I, um, I have seen a lot of birds uh, murdered in, in pits. I mean, I, they would last for six, eight hours, these, uh, these fights. And, uh, mm -hmm. So I've um, I've done some time in the in the ring, <laughs> or yeah. I guess in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how many years does this project span total for you? Um, so it took about four years for me to sort of uh, make, or I, or I made this work over the period of four years. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I really had no idea what I was doing when I I first started, and uh, so it definitely took a long time. Uh, also to develop all the relationships and I was uh, living in California at the time. I was fresh out of uh, college and uh, it really was like my first post college project. So yeah, this is when I finally got access to a pit. Um, yeah. And this, this picture here is the picture that I was referring to yeah. um, that kind of this gentleman's name was not Vic, but his, name's, Jay. his yeah. name's Jay, but was the inspiration for my fictional character. I was, um, I, this, this, uh, I, I feel like if I'd been standing up when I saw this picture, I would have fallen over backward. It was so good. Oh. Um, it was really, it just kind of hit me hard. And that's, that's where the story, you know, kind of grew out of. And, and then I should have mentioned too that because this is a manual, this was also, it was not just the pictorial kind of inspiration. I, if you open this, this is my version. There's a lot of underlining and uh, <laughs> things that- uh, Yeah, good information for you. Yeah. Nice. Mike, I can't get out of the screen share. Like, um, screen I, share. I can, <laughs> I might be able to help with that. Oh, uh -huh, here we go. I got you. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. There's I seriously like so many things I would love to ask both of you guys about uh, just in general, but I do want to at least before we get into the talking about the, the other books, um, give you guys a little opportunity to talk about this back and forth uh, with this project. Um, and I mean, I guess you already kind of spoke to that a little bit and, and, and how a future collaboration would look. Would it continue to be kind of this in reaction to each other kind of a thing or, uh, or actually work together yeah. on something? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I recently asked if 
also to participate in a project that is very much my own. It's actually the Guggenheim project that I proposed. And I had, um, I, I'm working with this publisher and I uh, actually hear press that um, I worked with some um, speaker piece. And uh, uh, they were, we were, it's a, it's a complicated project and they mentioned that um, it would be really nice if there would be maybe some ways to sort of incorporate both um, fiction essays and, and short, not, um, so, so short fiction and um, maybe a nonfiction essay to kind of contextualize this kind of complicated work. And um, mm -hmm. I really thought of Andrew because, um, as you know, I was a revolutionary. Where's that one? Um, it, it's a Andrew, I hate you say it. It's like a, a very contemporary historical novel. Uh, uh, but it um, it takes up um, history and politics in the way that the character that I'm trying to sort of illuminate, this man named Harry Cottle, who wrote Night Comes mm -hmm. Cumberlands. Um, and Andrew writes really beautifully around complicated historical figures. Um, and that is something that I was really drawn to when I first met Andrew and read this book. And so um, I asked Andrew to potentially think about writing a story, a fictional story about Harry Cottle. And uh, it didn't go over so well, Andrew. <laughs> well, I think the thing that's so interesting is we're very independent artists. Mm -hmm. We're artists who spend, you know, we don't have children. We spend, we are very dedicated to our work. Um, and we've been making that work as singular artists for a very long period of time now. And so, so I think it's, um, it's a really awkward dance. And so I really had to think about how to, so anyways, I didn't approach it very well, um, but I knew that it was a perfect fit. And so I sort of pushed him to reconsider the idea. Um, and, uh, and so I think you're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, so I've started my, Kind of Harry Cottle research and and um, hope to be working on that either this summer or the early fall and so that was an instance where we were kind of collaborating based on something that grew out directly out of Stacy's kind of work and and her kind of um, the ends for uh, or the goals for her kind of book project there the uh, the cockfighter story is it has now you know, kind of grown into a whole collection that I want to do called The Sporting Life um, that deals with these kind of, um, like I said, kind of strange, <laughs> weird aspects of, of sports um, and particularly in the American South. And, um, and so, I, you know, I think the, the project initially, like I said, grew out of me seeing Stacy's already existent kind of photographs on, on cockfighters in Louisiana. I think what we've talked about now, so, you know, she was kind of pushing me to, to, to write something about Coddle. Now I'm kind of pushing her to potentially photograph um, some things that I'm interested in writing about, whether it's, yeah. you, know, you know, prison rodeos or, um, you know, uh, veteran yeah, groups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, gambling, gambling, horse, yeah, ga horse, horse gamblers. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so we've been, um, so so I think the, the, the work will now kind of, even though it started off, you know, within this almost like ekphrasis, you know, where, you know, a writer writes in response to usually, usually it's a poet writing in response to painting, but, um, mm -hmm in this case, a prose writer writing in response to, to a photograph, I think now like the work will become more synchronous, like same, happening at the same time. And, and we've yeah. talked about, you know, trying to do a bit of traveling together to some of the things and places we, you know, that I want to write about and, and that um, I'm, twisting her arm to to shoot um no, um, no. Uh, but also we're we're so much of this is related to this tradition that we really adore um and have been really kind of obsessed with and also there's a really interesting contemporary turn to that um with um writers even who have become photographers like Teju Cole and um yeah, yeah. the this recent um I don't know if you guys saw the Jeff Charlotte book um so um, 
my weird dysfunctional hero, Volman, um, <laughs> who taught himself how to be a photographer and um, has this really amazing book where he um, his cross-dressing Dolores book. Huh. Where he actually writes the history of photography alongside Whoa. his yeah. bow of cross dressing. It, these are not oh, to be wow. missed. But, anyways, I think there's also like a really interesting world that we want to embrace because we love that 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 works. Uh, we want to yeah. participate in that tradition. Yeah, I, just, I love this idea of like prompting each other and and pushing each other just outside of your normal subject matter or interest or comfort zone, maybe like to to expand both of your practices. It's really, I think, going to be lead to a lot of great things. Well, part of how we, part of how we kind of fell in love was I, I was living in Alabama and, uh, and on an early date, we, we both realized we were kind of obsessed. Let us now praise famous. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and, you know, maybe on our second date we realized that and by our fourth we were doing a, a road trip together to to hale county to you know okay. retrace steps and, and to see you know william christian yeah. and stuff like cock fighting and prison rodeos and you know fucking sharecroppers and but there's a there's a wee bit of sort of vicey id sort of glorifying a although she says it was horrible but there's that sort of thing it's like Sexy, it's cool. Just I think someone's got their audio on exit. Graham. Hi, Graham. <laughs> oh, he muted. Uh, he muted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk more about that, uh, that book. Um, you guys uh, have that handy and want to. Oh, can we talk about some of the books? You mean some of the books that we are really Yeah, interested in? I mean, like the one you just mentioned, uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. That, oh, that, yeah. So, I, I mean, this for us is like a really important kind of, uh, for me, I'm sorry, this for me is an important rupture in the documentary tradition. And mm -hmm. so it's been this really formative book that because um, you have this really kind of elegant portfolio of images by Walker Evans that are mm -hmm. sort of the introduction. Um, and then um, this uh, text by A.G. is um, this, this first attempt in this documentary tradition to be really self-reflexive and kind of look at the documenter-documentee relationship and sort of unpack that. Um, and so for me, it is so... Gosh, it's like the, uh, it cracked open a whole new world because mm -hmm. um, before then we had the tradition of photography and writing. There's some really interesting and problematic work we really like by um, Ken Caldwell and Margaret Bourke White. Who A.G. and Evans were, you know, making their book in reaction to and against. You know. um, and we can maybe make a list for everyone of some of the stuff that we- We've already got people asking for that actually. Oh, so. we're happy to do that. <laughs> um, it is not authoritative, our list, but it is um, certainly a great like jumping off point. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really enjoyed kind of putting the list together. Um, there's also this incredible tradition here. Um, I think one of the most moving pieces that I discovered recently is the uh, Roy DeCarva, Langston Hughes collaboration. It, um, it's, uh, it, so basically in this case, uh, Langston took this really incredible body of work that Roy had made and he built uh, like a, a kind of novella or fictional essay around it. Um, and it's, um, it's actually really affordable. So I recommend anyone who can purchase this um, incredible uh, paperback version. Um, and then this one, is another mind blowing. It, this is this is a complex, heady work. The Avedon Baldwin collaboration mm -hmm. is um, it's uh, it was made you know kind of at the height of the civil rights movement, and it is dark and guttural and just mm -hmm. mind blowing. The um, what's so crazy about it is that Avedon and Baldwin they went to high school together. Oh wow! Yeah, and they um they were <laughs> both friends, yeah. they were editors of the literary the high school literary magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then they reconnected um 
in their adult lives and, and made this really, really interesting uh, body of work. What else do you mm. I was thinking, you know, one of the things we've been paying attention to is the, you know, is the how, how the, the, the text and the, the, the pictures kind of interact or how they were selected to kind of interact. And, you know, so you have um, Baldwin and Avedon, the book Stacy just showed, you know, sort of pairing, you know, making their work kind of simultaneously and, and very consciously crafting it to appear together. This is one that um, we just got recently, Richard Wright, uh, called 12 Million Black Voices, that had a different kind of process. It's, it's a kind of a really interesting um, kind of short book, long essay, um, written by Wright um, about the African American experience, particularly um, the movement out of the South with, with mechanization and, uh, and into um, uh, kind of more Northern urban cities. And what's interesting, uh, or one of the things that's, many things that's interesting about it is um, uh, in this case, there was just a photo editor who took all these FSA, Farm Security Administration photos from the depression and kind of grafted them in to write essay. So it was like less directly kind of collaborative than, um, than, than some of them. So yeah, we, we've just been kind of, you know, I, I think we're very much aware that we're, we're not doing anything new, but that we're part of a, a, a tradition and, and we're trying to see how, you know, people before us kind of did it and, and, um, and to see, you know, and drawing inspiration from that and, and some guidance from that, so, yeah. There's also this really wild follow-up to Let Us Now Praise Famous Men um, that was a collaboration between a writer and a photographer, and so they returned to visit these, these families. So I didn't properly introduce Let Us Now Praise Famous Men because I don't, I don't feel qualified, but it is a, it's the story of uh, several white sharecropper families and kind of this, this legacy and the sort of end of the, uh, that system. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this idea of like returning to this kind of work and re-engaging with the subjects, like I think that that's been famously done um, when we talk about like Dorothea Lange and the migrant mother and sort of actually finally hearing from her and how she felt about her representation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about Let Us Now Praise Famous Men is that the, these two uh, people went and did that, that work for us. So you have not only Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, but you have this mm -hmm. sort of look at what happened after that book came out and how their mm -hmm. lives were affected. And and also, I, you know, I will say, you know, like one of the glaring gaps in, in Let Us Now Praise Famous Men is that it focuses only on white sharecroppers. And one of the interesting things about And Their Children After Them is that they also look at, um, at you know, African-American, uh, the, the, the kind of descendants of African-American sharecroppers. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's a really, it's really one of the Pulitzer uh, in 88, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Are there examples of collaborations where it is the more like really direct kind of literal one-to-one -one relationship between the, the images and the text that you guys like, or do you tend to prefer like some separate, more of a gap between the two where they could kind of stand alone or be seen together and react to each other? I do like the direct relationship. Um, also, Kristen Berry, also kind of working in the same areas, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. He has this incredible book where he writes stories to go with his photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in most cases, there's a lot more writers taking up photography, but there are occasions where photographers do take up writing in a serious way. There's a few contemporary examples that I don't have um, because my budget is limited. Um, but I, I tend to like these sort of like um, the, sorry, I just want to like books? touch books. Oh. Uh, the Teja Cole book I actually haven't read yet. Um, um, I'm which, sure. Which Teja Cole book is it? This is like a, like I said, a great example where there is the direct relationship where Hughes uh -huh. is speaking directly to DeCarva's uh, photographs. And mm -hmm. I found it really moving. Um, and delightful to see that 
intimate conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. But Baldwin and Abaddon, they don't speak directly to each other, and that was really engaging. To um, yeah, yeah. I think that's you know like one of the interesting things is um, you know as Stacy said with the the Baldwin and Abaddon, they were consciously working on the project together, but they you know if you read the the kind of essay that Baldwin writes, it's not directly it's not obvious its connection to the pictures that Avedon has taken. And so I think sometimes that can be one of the most interesting and exciting things is, you know, to force the viewer or the reader to have to kind of make these connections to be like, you know, I mean, for me, uh, the, as, a, as a fiction writer, one of the prime examples of that is Faulkner and, and the Wild Palms, where he sets, mm -hmm. he essentially has two storylines that on a, on a surface level have nothing really to do with each other. You know, there's like one common reference in the two things, but he's, he pairs these two narratives side by side and alternates between them and forces, or, or, or doesn't force, asks the reader to kind of say like, why am I doing that? And, and so sometimes I think the, the, the relation between text and photograph is, is very apparent and obvious, as in like the Caldwell and Margaret Bork White. Um, and sometimes, you know it's it, it's a little less clear but it can be really interesting to kind of think about okay what's the relationship here mm -hmm. how is it interacting yeah um if anyone has any questions uh we were kind of at the eight o'clock we we normally try to kind of go till eight and then try to invite other people to join the conversation as you wish um if you have any questions about Anything we've talked about so far or any other books that uh, you're interested in discussing, um, feel free to type those in. And meanwhile, how can we get some sort of a list of what, what you guys have talked about to, to these guys? Um, maybe I can do get it to you um, either tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, again, it's not authoritative. It's just some of the stuff that we've had access to and adore, uh -huh. and it's a great jumping off point for everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there are a few things that um, you know we we need a, a winning lottery ticket to be able to purchase, <laughs> but um, but yeah, we've been able to kind of build a fairly a, a pretty good um, kind of little library of these collaborations, and um, we we you know love to to send that out to people and there is okay. like um i love one thing i love about it it's kind of like that relationship between uh truth and fiction and the documentary tradition um is that it's so all over the place the way these collaborations work um and it's not like um clear that one works the best um mm -hmm. and so they're all really interesting to engage with because i think they're you're going to be surprised at what you find really works uh you know you may not think that poetry and photography go really well together and in some cases they really don't but in some cases they really sing there um we don't actually have the um book with uh deborah luster's work but obviously uh cd Wright poems that go um with her monograph that's an incredible collaboration um but there are other places where i've seen uh poetry meet photography in really unsuccessful ways um so yeah, I mean, I think that what I hope people would do with that list is uh, kind of just explore it, just to sort of discern what feels right to what are the possibilities. That was what has been yeah. so exciting to me, to understand like that there are so many different ways um, to bring uh, photography and text together. Yeah, um, we are getting some questions in. Uh, and also Susan mentioned that we can when you give me that list we'll we'll add it to the link um whenever we post the recorded video so uh, <laughs> <All right. signing> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh so yeah the, the that list will be available to everyone on our website uh in the same place that we post the link to this video um okay let's get into a question here and hopefully uh, that works for everyone yeah. You can email me if you feel like you if I if you um don't can't can access that. Okay, from Jenna Garrett, uh for Stacy, your work is complex, it also feels collaborative. How do you explain your work to your subjects? 
Oh, in lots of different ways. And it is an ongoing conversation. One of the things that I learned really early on was that um, a, a subject may feel one way about the work at one point and have a really different relationship to it a couple years later. And so it isn't like, just because someone has given me feedback or said that they're okay and comfortable with the way that I use their image does not mean that it is that going to be that way indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I have problems with those releases, mm. uh, because I think then they sort of close down the, that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what the clear solution is about permissibility. I think that it's um, that it that it that the most important thing is that you're having an ongoing conversation with your subjects um, and always open to um, them their feelings in relation to the work. Mm -hmm. Just like a quick follow up for my own curiosity, if if someone tells you they they don't want their image to be used anymore, is that it? Do you cut that image or or yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I had made a decision kind of um, a few years ago that I had a, a particular incident with um, a, so a subject that uh, was the whole entire work. Um, yeah. and, so, uh, and he got very uncomfortable. And um, I, I learned like, I was, and, and actually he since came around. Um, mm. But um, it, I had to make a decision that there is no image, no project uh, that is more important than a human being and their feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. my, that's my like kind of bottom line. And so if anyone, you know, at some point does, and you know, I benefit from the fact that I make a ton of work for each project. I, what you would call like a classic overshooter. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, no individual image. And, and I tend to take that entire project down for a while. And mm -hmm. that was something that, um, that's just inherent to the nature of the work. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, Awesome that you react in that way, I think. Um, so another question from David Harity is, any suggestion on pushing the output of collaborative relationships to be more than parallel play? This is really fascinating, thanks. And I think that could be to either of you. Hi, Dave. Um, Dave's a friend of mine, oh, from a really you. wonderful <laughs> poet from, from Louisville. Oh, cool. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave, while you're unmuted, can I can I ask you to say a little bit more about that question? I'm I'm, I'm curious. So so um, I've always I've you know I've done a few different um, collaborations. Some of them successful, some of them unsuccessful, and I, and I haven't been able to pin this down. So I'd just be curious to hear the two of you talk about it sometimes when i go into relationships with visual artists and, and since i'm a poet um it can it can often feel like um, if you've ever had the experience of watching like toddlers play together sometimes they play like next to one another but not together and oh. and they're playing with the same toys they're playing with blocks right they're playing with the same pile of things but they're not playing together they're mm. playing separately and i feel like that happens um, in some collaborations, and I and I and I, I want to believe that it's more than just, oh, that's the nature of the two people that are working together. And yeah. so I wondered if if either of you could comment on that experience, if you've ever had it, or or what or what you might think about uh, that might be practical that could help people transcend that experience. And and I'd be curious to hear if other people have had that too. Well, I think um, you know my immediate reaction is that sometimes that the non-parallel play, the more collaborative kind of interaction, you know, happens, can happen both in kind of the um, the germinal idea phase. Like, I mean, I think, feel like Stacy and I, um, mm, that's good. You know, you know we, we, we kind of spitball and discuss things, you know, um, and, and in terms of figuring out like what might be something interesting to write about or to shoot and so, Sometimes it happens in that just the, the kind of early sexy ideas phase, I think of it. And then, you know, I guess, you know, maybe in terms of the, the actual getting things, you know, getting things shot and, and, and written, um, I wonder if, you know, I, I'm sure some of these collaborations of, well, I know some of these collaborations have happened, um, uh, 
where you know one has provoked the other in a very intentional and direct way um mm -hmm. so like to just use just the personal example that that started our our initial collaboration on this kind of um the, the cockfighting work and and the work beyond that is you know obviously stacy did that work way before we ever met and and had no idea that i would be interested in it and want to you know um uh write about it but i think there are examples of of much more intentional sort of saying like here's this thing i did you know how do you you know how do you want to engage that i think is one way you know the collaboration can be more direct and intentional instead of yeah the parallel play two people side by side yeah we're kind of related but we're you know we're playing with the same toy but we're we're not actually you know um playing together and sometimes i think that can be really interesting and exciting like obviously right. avidon baldwin is i think a really interesting example of that um but it is di there is distance there between the two works and they don't mm -hmm. and, and you feel that distance and so it isn't always like a hundred percent uh i think that intimacy is something that we probably all crave in work uh but uh we really benefit from the other part having the, the the relationship relationship um because we're talking about our independent work oh, i also right. have learned a lot of ways to um how to best approach andrew if i <laughs> it's all about making it seem well this is with anyone making it seem like it's their idea uh, like if yeah. you want yeah <laughs> there is a trick <laughs> yeah, that's rela that's relationships, right? <laughs> yeah, it's relationships, and then it also works really well for the collaboration, uh, the collaborative relationship, I think, too. Um, I, I don't know, there probably is no clear solution uh, that, because every artist is so different. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Andrew, your your answers were were quite practical and and helpful. And and Stacy, I think that you you pointed out something that hadn't occurred to me that I really liked that that intimacy isn't necessarily the main trapping of a collaboration right mm -hmm. um and so that's a that's another thing that i hadn't thought about so thanks yeah i mean thank yeah thanks david I, I think that's kind of what i was thinking too is that that parallel play metaphor um i think as far as the collaborations i've had especially with writers uh or with anybody even outside of photography, just collaborations in general, uh, creative collaborations. I think that that space between is really part of part of the magic and and what's interesting about collaborating is each individual voice having their own space, playing their own way, and and then uh, how they how they find each other and interact with each other can be really really great. Um, okay, we have more questions, plenty more. Uh, Stacy mentioned, oh, this is from Natalie. Uh, Stacy mentioned colonialism a couple of times. If possible, I would be interested to hear more about how she and Andrew deal with this in their work, if at all. Do you deal with it in your work much? Um, yeah, I certainly use the term much more than I would say Andrew does, although we're both interested in like that that history um but uh yeah i mean i think that i became like a lot of this really was something that i learned about when i studied the history of documentary photography and saw how directly related it was to colonialism uh and that the discovery of all and the conquering of all of these different places there were always photographers so the early history of photography is especially the documentary tradition is very tied to colonialism and that was um uh really fascinating to me and then kind of trying to learn or i kind of wanted to uh be open and transparent about how i'm participating in that legacy and so i've been kind of obsessed with finding ways to uh show that in my work how uh and it's also like a challenge to myself to say, well, how can I elevate that conversation? And that's the conversation, like, I obviously don't want to be participating in the colonial project, um, or I don't think anyone does once they're aware of the problems of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the, the uh, fucked up power dynamic. And 
Um, and so as much as that is uh, inherent to photography in so many ways, it's also like a great uh, thing to think about because it challenges you to explore new ways of storytelling that attempt to kind of undo that. Um, and most of my attempts, I would say, are incredibly unsuccessful. Uh, yeah. I think my attempt to be Christy is a little bit silly and kind of, uh, but it, it, I think that it's more about the fact that at least I'm, at least I'm fucking trying, you know, oh, yeah. kind of what I tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I think we can move on to the next question then. Uh, this one is from Angelica Marks, also for Stacy. I know some of your Frederick friends are, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know some of your subjects are friends of yours. How do you feel about, uh, or how do you select subjects that are strangers? So um, the subjects that are friends were originally strangers. Um, essentially, it's um, a lot of the people that, that I, so most of the people, I would say like nine, so there's like a, it, it's sort of kind of, is divided. There's people that I, I just engage with, like you would encounter like in maybe street photography, where I sort of meet them, I say hello, I ask to take their picture, I photograph them, and then we're kind of, that that's the end of that relationship. There, there is a large chunk of people in the work that that's the uh, extent of the engagement. Um, then there's um, another group of people in the work that are people that I meet on the street and I somehow feel a connection to them or, um, there's like a desire to linger and kind of build the relationship. And that um, then uh, has over time, because I've been making this work for so long, just continued. And they are, I believe those people who I've developed these longer relationships with have fundamentally uh, made that the work that I do so much stronger, so much more real, so much better, so much uh, deeper. Um, and so once I realized that, I kind of was um, hooked on the idea that I can't really make this work without at least, it's not like you're gonna be friends with every single person you photograph. It's a, that would be, I think a little too crazy for me um, because um, I am actually a bit of a hermit. <laughs> it may not be clear in the work, uh, but, but yeah. So, um, but in every project, I at least have a couple really close, uh, friendships that I develop with strangers. Um, and they do in some ways become collaborators. Um, but I also don't want to undermine like um, the power dynamic there. I'm still like calling all the shots with the, uh, <laughs> with the way that I edit the work. Um, but, but one of my good friends in the, in the project, um, you know, came up with the title of this of, mm. as it was given to me. So, yeah, in so many ways, those those relationships are um, th the work wouldn't be what it was it is without it. What I'm curious about the title as it was given to me and the parentheses around the end. What is what's that about? So it's actually um, not that far from you. You probably passed through Newport, Tennessee, Cook County. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mike happens to live very close, uh, just on the other side of them, right? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, very large mountain. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so, uh, so my friend uh, lived there, and there's actually this um, newspaper. I, I definitely love a good local newspaper. I, I get a lot out of <laughs> uh, the archives of local newspapers. And um, the Cock County, I actually don't know what the newspaper is called, but it's the Cock County newspaper. And the um, there's a column called As It Was Give to Me. And it's As It Was Give to Me because that's the way people talk in that particular so region of Tennessee. Idiomatic speech, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and so I loved that if I added that in, I was um, exploring the insider-outsider relationship, right? I'm mm. the outsider, I couldn't, I wouldn't, like if I attempted to say as it was give to me, it, it wouldn't be natural, it wouldn't, yeah. be right? I would be playing a role. Um, huh. And so that's where the end comes from. That's really cool, I love that. Um, we have another question for Stacy from Emily Asirin. Oh, Emily, uh, I um, went to high school with Emily's brother. Oh. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, uh, her question is, what do you think of photographers working in video slash film? 
Would you take on a video project in collaboration with the writer? Also, how do you maintain the level of trust you have with subjects throughout your projects to any dropout? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I have um, complicated relationships with um, the people, um, all, all people in my life. I'm a complicated person. <laughs> I'm not that easy to be around. And so that extends to my, um, my partner and it extends to the subjects that become my friends. Uh, that, yeah, that's across the board. So there's been falling out and there's been, um, <laughs> uh, but a lot of times those falling outs like uh, we are able, like all friend, long-term friendships, able to like rebuild the connections. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like usually it's um, not, those relationships are not any different from my regular friendships, which are complicated. Um, and then about the video, I, I really think that video is so interesting because it is a collaborative medium. I have made videos by myself, but they suck because I think they really benefit from having, you know, potentially a camera person and a sound person to help you make the work. And um, I would throw a writer in there um, as well. And um, I, I feel like, the work that we do, um, it can get very stale. We can, tr I'm, I'm great at treading water of my own work. I think all of us struggle with that, you know, cause we become good at one way of telling a story. Um, so I, I think that the most exciting thing we can do is challenge ourselves with um, new uh, media, um, new mediums and um, different um, experiments, different storytelling methods. Well, guys, I think uh, I think maybe we should wrap it up. Uh, this has been awesome, and I know I personally have a whole lot of other questions I'd love to ask you guys, but I'd like to just be respectful of everyone's time. And um, thank so, yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I I love that I actually know you guys, so I can continue this conversation uh, <laughs> another time. Yeah, um, you guys are welcome back at the Nook anytime. Oh, so. <laughs> we love it there. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks, yeah, Mike. Of course everyone for thank you coming to hang out with us yeah um and like i said before this will be available to anyone um if you want to share it with someone who wasn't avail available to come tonight there will be a link on our website um i think well i may be saying this wrong but i think it's in the uh content section drop down it might be in i don't know anyway you'll find it and uh We'll also have a list of books that we talked about tonight and maybe any other ones that are on your list of uh, favorites. And yeah, thank everyone so much for coming. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for giving me your time and your thoughts and uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, have a good night. Wait, let's just see if we can see from here. Yeah. Well, I guess we have to leave. Them. For those of you that are still on the call, I want to remind you all about Bruce Jackson's um, talk on Thursday night, um, especially if you're interested in conversations about collaboration, his long um, time collaborator, um, Diane Christian will also be with him on that call. So we encourage you to join us. You can sign up on the six feet photography website. And thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Um, we'll just give it one more minute and then we're just gonna sign everyone off. Mm -hmm.